Right. Okay, cool. This thing's on. Um, before I get started, I have one huge um, thing to ask, and I, I apologize because I know everyone just got up and left. Can everyone please stand up? And this will only take like one second, please. Um, for, for me to do the talk, I have to do this. All right. Um, now, start clapping. All right. All right. We're good now. So now when I go home, I can tell everyone that I got a standing ovation in Amsterdam. So it doesn't matter how my talk goes, no pressure. All right, my name is Nader Dabit. Um, I'm with the Graph Protocol at Edge and Node Web3 companies. I'm a developer and author, um, done open source and stuff. The most um, important thing that I kind of really enjoy doing though is teaching and being part of like developer relations, which is my job, I, could, I get to do that a lot. So um, I'm really excited here to be talking about something that I'm currently very, very interested in and it's um, having to do with building decentralized full stack applications. And you've probably heard a lot about Web3 uh, lately, and we actually just had a really great talk from Luke. So I'm going to kind of like dive into a little bit more of the technical aspect of building full stack applications and not talk about hopefully any of the hype and buzzwords like we often hear in the space. Now, Luke gave a very good explanation of what Web3 is, and I'm gonna also give my own. To me, it kind of really boils down to something really basic. And it's this idea of Web3 is essentially just the stack of protocols that enable people to build fully decentralized applications. And I'm going to kind of talk about that tech stack in this talk a lot and hopefully give you a, a good understanding so you can walk away with this and expand your current skill set. Because um, what I'm going to talk about is how I, I believe this isn't like something that replaces anything that we had before. And, and instead, it kind of expands all of the different things that we're able to do so we can still continue building applications that we uh, could have done so with our existing skill set. But now we just have new things that we can also build and we kind of combine that and now we have more apps that we can build and more opportunities that we can have. So what does that actually mean though? Well, we've been having these decentralized web protocols for a very long time actually and that's what the internet is built on. We've all used FTP, uh, HTTP, SSH, things like that. Uh, either knowingly we've used them or maybe under the hood uh, they just enable us to build stuff. Um, but there are a few different protocols that were missing or things, uh, pieces of functionality you could say that were missing from all of the existing protocols that we've worked with in the past. So we've built out fully um, centralized and often complex systems to kind of enable these things. And a few of them are state, compute, payments, um, digital scarcity or, or what we would consider scarcity. And this would have to do with the numbers that show up in our bank account, like who actually controls like what that information is. And to enable all this stuff, we built out really, really complex infrastructure. And I think one of the most, um, the, one of the best examples is when you actually think about what happens if you live somewhere like me in Mississippi in the United States and you wanna send a payment to someone in a different country. A lot of our family and friends live in Palestine and the financial infrastructure there is a lot different than it is in Mississippi. But even just for me to actually create an account and have, uh, I guess you could say, some type of uh, payment system online, there is a lot of red tape and a lot of hoops that you have to, to kind of jump through to make that happen. And this isn't even counting all of the code that's written from my bank and from companies like PayPal that kind of put all this stuff together. And um, what you end up having is a very, very complex set of systems that kind of just do something as sim simple as sending some type of uh, value between two parties. So to me, what we actually have with uh, these new protocols and also, and I, and I hate to only bucket Web3 into kind of blockchain because it's not just that. The way I see it, it's kind of like the decentralized web. So also bucket things like the evolution and the improvements that we've seen in peer-to-peer -peer data, uh, peer -peer databases that offer free um, data storage based on the network. It's kind of like the combination of all of the existing protocols that we had before, along with these new protocols that we have now mat um, maturing that are able to, to be used. So to me, it's kind of like the combination of all of the existing technologies that we had in the past, along with these new pieces of functionality, you could say, native payments, uh, native state, and native compute that are kind of built into these protocols. So this kind of then gets into what the characteristics uh, are of Web3, and this is kind of gonna uh, mimic a little bit of what Luke talked about uh, for a, you know, just a moment, but this whole idea of decentralization, not only of the web infrastructure, but often also of the companies and the teams and the protocols that are being built. So you have less 
li uh, less likely of a hood where you end up having like a single group of people that have a lot of ownership and then often instead with these protocols, anyone that contributes to building them or um, to actually working in them receives more ownership. So you end up seeing more equitable share of ownership often with these uh, projects. Um, this idea of digital scarcity, um, native payments in state, uh, displaced intermediaries, which uh, were, are what smart contracts enable. Um, this idea of robust and uh, decentralized and distributed uh, infrastructure. So when we think about a traditional database, it can be running even in something like AWS, but if you have a single area like US East that goes down, you end up having a large portion of the internet going down. Whereas on a decentralized protocol, something like a, um, a ceramic network or maybe even GunDB or even something like Ethereum, 90% of the network can go down and your application will still be working. Self-sovereign identity, uh, Luke talked about some ideas around that and that's a huge rabbit hole you could dive into in and of itself. But most importantly to me as a developer, these last few pieces, open and composable backends, free to consume, open source by nature and open by nature, public, trustless and immutable. So what are the types of applications that people are building? Well, you, the first iteration and the, the first applications that you kind of saw people were uh, using because of uh, crypto, which is kind of like the first, I would say, application of this technology were finance. So you end up seeing payments as a very, very basic, uh, understandable use case, um, decentralized finance, but the uh, financial application that really is the most interesting to me is stable coins because stable coins enable people all around the world to have access to uh, a type of currency that does not see hyperinflation. So here in, in the United, well here in the European Union and the United States, we don't really have to worry uh, as much about this, but in parts of the world like in South America and um, parts of Africa and the Middle East and really in uh, other areas as well, you end up seeing like a uh, thousand percent inflation or hundreds uh, percent of inflation per year. And in places like Lebanon and, and many other places, you often have the government comes in and, and doesn't even allow you to re uh, pull your money out. So you're kind of like locked in and then over the course of the year, you lose like 90% of the value. Um, that's because it's centralized and it's controlled and you can't really do anything about it. But also you're pegged to a currency that is going down in value. Um, decentralized web infrastructure protocols, that's one of the protocols that I work with called the graph that we're gonna talk about in just a moment. Uh, gaming, decentralized autonomous organizations, um, tokenization of physical assets like real estate. <coughs> and the reason that that's interesting and important is that a lot of people are kind of locked out of the real estate market because you need uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars uh, to kind of like participate. But if you can kind of fractionalize and, and lo offer a lower, lower barrier to entry, um, what we're seeing is now people can kind of uh, invest with tens or hundreds of dollars as opposed to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, digital art, which is kind of the NFT area. And something that's uh, happening right now is that you're seeing kind of people apply these, this, this tech stack to web threeifying, you could say, uh, traditional applications. So you have um, projects like Audius, which are a decentralized Spotify. You have stuff that is uh, in the blogging area. You have social media apps that are being built, um, et cetera. So, to me, the most, if you take away one single thing from this talk, um, this is probably the most important thing that I think people should understand as, as far as like what I think about this entire space is that I don't think it replaces anything. And in fact, I think it's instead, you could think of it as like, okay, I learned React, now I can build mobile applications, I can build front end applications, I can build all this other stuff. I learned JavaScript, I can build server side applications, I can build front end. Um, I, I feel like this is just a new set of technologies that then allow you to build financial applications and um, these other types of applications. So like you don't have to like learn this and then work in it full time. Instead, you might learn this and you might uh, you know, learn how to write some solidity and then you have an opportunity that comes up and you can actually take that opportunity if it interests you. It doesn't mean you need to abandon any of the things that you're doing and none of this stuff is actually gonna replace everything that we had in the past. You will see some disruption, right, in certain areas, but in general, I think it's just expanding what the capabilities of what we have. We had machine learning come along. It didn't replace everything. It just allowed us to build new things. That's the way I look at this stuff. And that's, to me, the most important thing to kind of understand about this stuff. So let's talk about the, the, the tech stack here. So I wrote a blog post called Defining the Web3 Stack at the end of last year. At Edge and Node, we actually had a full-time research team working on understanding 
the different protocols and the different things that were available for developers to start building this stuff. Because we saw a lot of hype last year, but there isn't a lot of, I would say, polished tooling and protocols for us to actually actualize and realize a lot of these ideas, right? So um, with the Web3 space, you see a lot of investment coming on, so you see a lot of competing projects. And if you actually start diving into stuff and you go on Twitter and you go on Google and you start looking for answers, what you end up with are thousands of different projects often accomplishing the exact same thing. And it's very, very, very um, confusing. And just like if you were someone new coming into the JavaScript space, you end up getting overwhelmed. So what we wanted to do was kind of like narrow this down. And we wanted to do this for a few different reasons. One of the things that we work on at Edge of Node is Web3 education. So we think that broadening the entire ecosystem of developers will help, will help everybody. We also are having uh, a launching soon a venture capital arm. So understanding all the projects that are out there will allow us to invest better. But also we uh, work with the graph protocol, which indexes uh, public data. So if we understand the different applications that are out there and we understand where people are building, we know which projects we want to support within our protocol. So based on all of the research that we did last year, I was able to kind of work with those researchers. It was just a couple of them, but uh, they did spend a lot of time doing this stuff and we wrote this blog post called Defining the Web3 Stack. And I wanted to narrow it down to kind of show an entry point for developers that wanted to kind of start building this stuff but didn't want to get overwhelmed. And we wanted to categorize this in a way that was understandable for new developers. Because what I'm gonna talk about in just a moment is kind of how I think about building stuff in the traditional web space. So what we did was like try to explain that this isn't everything, right? This is not the entire ecosystem, but if you wanted to get, just get started building, you might reach for different pieces in the stack. And coming from the traditional web space, you might think of, okay, I wanna build an app. I want to build out a Twitter or something like that. What are the different components that you need? Well, for me, I have a conceptual tech stack that I could reach for. I've been writing code for like 10 years, and I wanted to say, okay, I wanna build out a social media app. I need a database. I need a place to store images and videos. I need a compute layer. I need web hosting. Like these, these are the core components that if I want to build something, I can get 95% of the way there, right? That other 5% will, will be the differentiator that you might go and do, do some other weird stuff like AI or machine learning or whatever, and that might even fall into the compute layer. But with this core stack, you can build most applications, I think. So what does that look like in the Web3 space? Well, it's, it's somewhat similar, but it's also different. Um, due to the nature of blockchain data, you have this idea of um, data that's kind of written in blocks over time. So you, you write some information, it gets saved, and then more information gets saved, and it kind of it goes forward in, in, in a fashion like that. A traditional database is created and optimized for both read and write operations, whereas blockchains are typically only optimized for write operations. That's why when uh, Bitcoin is being kind of um, uh, often, you could think of, not, not replaced, but innovated upon because it's slow and it's expensive and it's energy inefficient. Um, Ethereum came next, it offered more functionality, but it's also slow and it's also inefficient, it's also energy uh, re uh, resource intensive and it's bad for, the, uh, bad for um, uh, energy and stuff like that. Um, so what you end up having is like innovation happening, but all of it's happening around the right operation. So now you have blockchains like Solana that are like 400 millisecond latency for blocks. It's really inexpensive to write a transaction, but what no one really talks about is reading this data. That's because if you want to actually read the data from the blockchain, you end up needing to actually read through all of the data that's been written, stored in a database, and create some type of API layer on top of it. Now, if you wanted to kind of build that yourself from scratch, it's quite a bit of work. That's one of the things that we work on at the graph. We offer kind of a protocol for this. But this is a lot different than what we think. When we want to read data from a database, we spin up a serverless endpoint or an uh, EC2 instance or some type of server somewhere. We write our business logic, we talk to our database, and then we talk to the API from our front end and we get that data and that's kind of how that works. Um, identity and authentication, we have a concept of identity in the uh, Web3 space. Luke covered that really well. And there's, again, a really deep dive that we could go to into just that. Um, Data is a lot different though, because in, in the traditional like web space, we have, um, we have a lot of private data, but most of the data that you're working with in Web3 applications is public data. So what that should tell you immediately is that there are applications that you definitely wouldn't want to build in Web3, right? You probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to build a private messaging app 
on Web3 because all of that data is going to be stored in a public uh, ledger somewhere. Now, there are encryption techniques and stuff like that, but I don't think we're quite there yet for most developers to kind of, and most, um, I would say, companies or projects to kind of build something as sophisticated as something like Signal or something like that in the, uh, in the blockchain space or the Web3 space. Um, you, you do have storage as well. So in, in the traditional web space, we have something like S3. In the Web3 space, we have something like IPFS or Rweave, which I'll talk about in just a moment. You still need a place to host your website. And we have this introduction of a new primitive called smart contracts that are a place for you to kind of write your blockchain uh, business logic. So um, when that's kind of all you could call back-end infrastructure stuff. But on the front end, the really cool part is that I've been a front-end developer for all of my life, and I've actually been a full-stack developer for the last four years. But I found that all of my front-end skills were transferable. So if I was writing React code, I could go into the blockchain uh, cryptocurrency job website and see jobs that were paying like, you know, 200K that I could literally get tomorrow if I wanted to because everything that we've done in the past on the front end is actually still being used in the Web3 space with a few small caveats. Um, in, in our applications, we have typically um, REST endpoints or GraphQL endpoints. In Web3, you typically are talking to an RPC endpoint. An RPC endpoint is just, uh, it's, it's very similar in the sense that you're kind of like making some type of HTTP call to some type of network and you're either posting data or you're reading data. Um, and that gets us to our next point. Instead of post operations or delete, um, when you're calling to kind of like write data, you have this idea of a transaction. And a transaction is typically when you're kind of writing some data to a network. Um, and then we have about five minutes left. I'm definitely aware of the timing here. Um, and then also this idea of reading data from a blockchain, if you want to read information, you have a very limited amount of data that you can read directly from the network. I mentioned this idea of indexing and then querying your data. So in uh, Web3, you typically need to kind of like have some type of querying layer built in. So what does the Web3 stack look like? I'm going to kind of give a brief overview of some of, the some of those pieces that I mentioned just a moment ago. The graph protocol is what I work with. Again, this is an indexing and querying layer. So what you can do with the graph is define a smart contract somewhere. You can define your data model using GraphQL. You deploy your subgraph or your API to the network. We index all of that, and we kind of provide you with a GraphQL endpoint for you, for you to use in your application. For off-chain data, and this is the most exciting space for me right now, is this idea of we're now seeing uh, additional innovations in peer-to-peer -peer data, peer-to-peer -peer databases. And these uh, protocols like Ceramic are actually free to use. So you don't have to write, you don't have to pay any uh, money to write operations to this network. Um, they are building out a tokenized uh, incentive for the people running the infrastructure to, uh, to allow this to happen. And it already works and people are using it today. I think the challenges right now with peer-to-peer with -peer data is also the indexing and querying because they don't offer like a really robust querying layer. Um, so you actually have to kind of do that yourself. And we're actually adding support to Ceramic Network to make that easier uh, within the next few months. Live Peer is a live streaming and video streaming service that is a protocol built on uh, Web3 that would be something that you would use to build something like Twitch or YouTube. For file storage, IPFS and Rweave, as well as uh, Filecoin are a few examples of how you might uh, store images, videos, and stuff like that. The most interesting thing to me, though, about uh, Rweave, for example, is that it offers this idea of permanent storage. Just like on a blockchain, you pay a single transaction cost, and you now can read that data forever. You upload an image to Rweave, you pay a transaction cost, and you never have to pay hosting ever again. And the network is there forever, supposedly. <laughs> but like, if you think about S3, what happens if you don't pay your bill one month or whatever happens? Your data is like gone, right? Well, the cool thing with Rweave, you pay a single transaction, you can read that data 10 years from now without paying another penny. You can also, ho you can also upload static sites there as well, which is pretty, pretty freaking cool. Um, Radical is a decentralized Git hosting protocol. So if you wanted to kind of build a censorship resistant um, code base and you wanted to also build it in Web3, you could use something like Radical. Um, Luke covered some different wallets earlier. Uh, a few of the examples that you might use um, when you're dealing with identity um, are going to, uh, well, I would say kind of like just assuming you watch this talk, but people maybe watching this video didn't. When you're dealing with identity, you typically are working with a wallet. I think there's a lot of um, problems, though, even calling it a wallet. And maybe that's something that hopefully they, they work on as far as wh what this is. Because 
Uh, while it insinuates monetary value, when in reality it's a combination of a bunch of things, including identity, but um, for EVM networks like Ethereum, you can use MetaMask or Rainbow. Phantom is a Solana wallet, and there are multiple wallets that are out there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, for self-sovereign identity, the Ceramic Protocol al also offers a way for people to manage their own identity. So if you do want to associate your username with something like a Twitter handle or something like that, you can actually do that in a single place, and then all the applications that rely on Ceramic will then get updated, and you have full control over your identity by uh, leveraging self.id from Ceramic. And then for the development frameworks, if you want to actually write a lot of this code, like Solidity or Rust or Solana or whatever, there are some really, really great and very, very quality end-to-end uh, -end frameworks for blockchain development that are very intuitive for JavaScript developers like myself. Uh, two of my favorite ones are Hardhat and Foundry, which are created by um, different teams. Hardhat was funded completely by the Ethereum Foundation. It's uh, uh, one of the good examples of, like <coughs> of uh, these grants programs that are out there. And then Foundry is actually uh, funded by a VC firm. Um, one example of something else that's coming out that, that's interesting to me, has anyone here ever used Homebrew? So all, almost all of us probably have, if we're, if we're building stuff, have, have come into contact with Homebrew. One of the most famous things about uh, Homebrew is the founder is Max Howell, and he got rejected from Google, even though his interviewer was like using um, Homebrew and all the people that work there. And he talks about that, and it is pretty ridiculous, right? Um, another thing he's kind of uh, famous for talking about is the fact that he built software that's powering probably trillions of dollars worth of value, and he could not make enough money to kind of like feed his family, so he had to go find a new way to make money. So he is launching a new Web3 protocol that is an on-chain package registry in an attempt to kind of like build some type of like sustainable funding model for himself and a new package registry that supposedly will have some improvements. One of the improvements, th this is kind of a bunch of different words, but <laughs> um, and I'm kind of needing to, to hurry now, but one of the improvements that I'm most excited about is he's progr programmed into the network a incentive and a mechanism to pay downstream contributors of different packages that are being used. So if I build the next Amazon, there's nothing stopping me from building a trillion dollar company and like using um, his open source project and never paying him a penny and it's gonna like be completely fine. So how do we actually pay open source maintainers? Well, hopefully this might be some way to do that. It's pretty cool. And I'm, I have a big fan of homebrew and I respect uh, him in general. And I'm almost done with my talk. I'm a few minutes over already. Uh, if you wanna get started in this space and you don't wanna quit your full-time job, there are uh, over $10 billion uh, of grants programs that are available today. Uh, the incentive mechanism behind a grant, why would someone pay people to, to build stuff? Well, these networks rely on value creation by network effects. So the more users they have, the more value their network is worth. And they typically, if they're a large protocol, have anywhere between $100 million to $1 billion set aside for grants programs. So if you want to get your foot in the door, like learning and building this stuff, you don't have to do it for free. You can go to their grants page and say, hey, I want $10,000, and in exchange for that, I'm going to build out some small package, or I'm gonna build a tutorial, or I'm gonna hold a, a workshop somewhere, kind of like teaching your stuff. And, and this way you get paid to learn, and you can also um, build a network within those communities. Um, Gitcoin is also a good uh, protocol for finding different projects that are giving away this money. Um, I only have a couple slides left, and I'm over, about, over one minute now, but I'm, I'm about to finish up. Um, one really important part of this entire space to me that people don't talk about a lot is this idea of open and public backends. Now, when we think of uh, really open and public APIs that people have built powerful business on, businesses on in the past, you might have remembered back when Twitter had a really nice API, you ended up having multiple businesses that were worth like tens of millions of dollars building on Twitter. But one day they just decided to kind of change their API because when they see people competing on their, their, their application with different front ends, that takes away from their possible funding with ads and stuff. So what if instead we had these different back ends that were completely immutable that no one could cut off? We knew the data is always gonna be there. Well, that's kind of uh, one of the most important concepts behind Web3, and you already see this happening, and I'm gonna uh, go over those examples as I wrap up. Um, and the way, I, the way I like to call this is like live open source infrastructure. We've always had open source software. What if we also had open source backends and open source infrastructure? And what I'm talking about here are Web3 APIs. Traditional APIs, centralized, mutable, brittle, they change over time and they can be shut down at any time. 
Web3 APIs are uh, open and composable. Anyone can build upon them. Anyone can write. Anyone can read to them. And now we have this, this protocol that's running that anyone can kind of build a front end on, or you can combine multiple protocols together to build out new um, experiences. How is this being used? It's being used all over the place, but uh, the earliest examples are DeFi with over $1 trillion of transaction flow. All of these uh, protocols are completely free and open source for anyone to fork or use. You can literally build on them or you can fork them and, and essentially launch them yourself. Um, and then this, op this idea of open and immutable data is kind of what goes along with that. But um, I'm over time, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and go to challenges and we're gonna stop. What are the challenges? It's a nascent space, there's too much hype right now. Protocols are slower to build and to iterate on. Financial incentives attract bad actors. We've lowered the barrier to entry for financial applications. We've also lowered the, the barrier to entry for scammers. Uh, the wallet UX today is really bad. Even the name wallet is actually really bad, in my opinion. Um, we have a tendency towards centralization because it's slower to, to, and harder to build. It's easier to just build a centralized version of something, so you end up seeing that happening often. Um, disinformation, I think we have a lot of maximalism on both sides. People hate it or people love it, but in reality, it's kind of like a trade-off, just like most technologies. So that's it. I just want to thank you for checking out my talk, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this event.